Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Diana Schwartz Francisco, Assistant Instructional Professor in the Center for Latin American Studies here at the University of Chicago. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this fourth presentation of the GIS in Latin America webinar series organized by the Center for Latin American Studies or CLASS and the Department of Anthropology and sponsored by the Licht Stern Fund. Now I'm thrilled to introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Omar Alcover Firpi earned his PhD in anthropology at Brown University in 2020 and is currently the content specialist in the education department at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art or LACMA. His research incorporates archaeological, geospatial, and remotely sensed data to investigate the long-term modifications of the environment and cooperative labor in both the past and the more recent history of the Sierra de la Candón in Northern Guatemala. His talk today, Geospatial Data and Human-Centered Landscapes in Guatemala, draws on some of his research to discuss the advantages and limitations of applying geospatial analysis and image processing technologies. Please join me in welcoming Omar. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for being here today. I'm very excited to give a talk to you all uh, about a portion of my dissertation and previous research that I've done in Guatemala. Uh, I particularly want to thank Dr. Brittenham and Dr. Newman for the invitation, as well as Natalie Arsenal, Lindsay Ortega, and Diana Schwartz, and everyone else at the Center for Latin American Studies who organized this event. You know, and before moving forward with my talk, I want to recognize the people and land from which I am giving my presentation. The Los Angeles County is the ancestral and unceded territories of the Gabrielino Tonga, the Gabrielino Quiche, and the Fernandeño Tataviam and, and Ventureño Chumash peoples. Los Angeles County has been and is home to many indigenous peoples whose ancestral lands are here and elsewhere. And I would like us for please to take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that have brought us here together and join us in a refusal to accept oppressive systems as they are. In today's presentation, I'm gonna be discussing how archeologists, particularly those of us that have worked in Guatemala, have employed geographic information systems, remotely sensed data, along with ethnographic and ethnohistoric data to document archeological sites, analyze activities and movements in the past, as well as better present results to a wider public. And so throughout today's presentation, uh, I will be highlighting how my team used different technologies such, such as satellite imagery, photogrammetry, uh, as well as airborne LIDAR to better understand the long-term landscape adaptations of early Maya peoples. So as such, I'm gonna draw on two case studies from this region. Uh, I was first focused on the site of Macabilero, which is located along the Usumacinta River Valley of eastern, northeastern Guatemala. And then I'm going to briefly move and talk a little bit about the site of El Sot, which is so located in central Guatemala. And we can see those two sites here on this map in red. So before getting into how my team has been using these technologies, I want to provide a little bit of history. I want to recognize that you know, the use of remotely sensed data is not particularly new in archaeology, nor is it very new to research in Guatemala and even in Mexico. In Mesoamerica, very broadly speaking, so this area that comes, that uh, uh, includes portions of Mexico and Central America, researchers have been implementing various remote sensing systems in order to locate archaeological sites, identify micro and macro environments, illuminate possible ancient roads, as well as answer questions about agricultural practice at the regional level. So between 1929 and 1930s, uh, we had some of the first flights over the Yucatan Peninsula and Northern Guatemala. And these were instrumental in justifying the continued incorporation of new technological advances in archeological research. Some of the first people to, to do this work were Rickardson and Kidder, uh, who were on the plane during these first flights and managed to identify preliminary patterns about the geology and ecology near archeological sites, suggesting that the Maya, the early Maya, built their cities in important positions on the landscape. And so uh, by the 1960s, aerial photography became an integrated, uh, integral element of regional research in Mesoamerica. So by this time, archeologists were using some of the more cutting edge technologies, which were 
aerial cameras such as the K20. Uh, they were using even different roles such as the Super X, infrared, and even color film to document sites from the air. Ray Matheny was one of the first people to use these camera and he used them to highlight elements of the local topography and ecology. And in some areas with low vegetation, these images even help identify completely new sites that weren't documented uh, previously. And you know, this is an image of the island of Florence. So for people that have worked in Northern Guatemala, you know, it looks much different now. There's a bridge actually connecting it to the main portion of the land. But here we see some of these early instances from Rickinson and Kidder's flight in the 30s where they documented these spaces. And here's another view of some of these same flights of the site of Washartoon as seen through the air. And so results from these early ventures into remote sensing uh, would really set the stage for its regular use and incorporation within uh, modern archaeological practices. Um, I do want to highlight as well that, you know, by the 80s onwards, there was a change in both the research questions being asked as well as the technology that was available to archaeologists. So by this time, we see an increase in access to multispectral satellite imagery, as well as an improvement in computer systems. And some of the two people to take advantage of this, of these new improvements were Tom Sever and Payson Sheets, who in the late 80s uh, were some of the first to incorporate multiple remote sensing sensors into their studies, integrating data from very early LIDAR, synthetic aperture radar, and even a multispectral scanner known as TIMS. And so these research incorporated this data uh, and to investigate patterns in the location of homes, ancient roads, and active volcanic areas. And this is one of the ways, uh, this was in many ways the opening for the current GIS studies where archaeologists are able to combine multiple sensors uh, and data to answer complex questions about the past. And so one, way, one of the ways that GIS has become an integral component of archaeological research is when documenting landscapes, uh, sites, features, and even individual objects recovered from surveys and excavations. So with the improvement of technologies like LIDAR and photogrammetry, which we'll expand on more during this talk, we're better able to document whole landscapes at sites at a rate and resolution that was simply not possible before, particularly because the dense jungles of Northern Guatemala prevented this large scale uh, understanding of what was going on in this space. And so, to better understand how we're using these new technologies, or how, I should say, how we're using these improved technologies, let's take a look at the site of Macabilero, which is where I did my dissertation research. So Macabilero, you can see it here at the center, uh, almost at the center of this map, is located within the Sierra de Lancandong National Park in Northern Guatemala. So the park forms a Northwestern boundary between Northern Guatemala and the state of Chiapas in Mexico. And it is known for its tropical wetland forests, its rugged karst topography, and natural limestone sinkholes, which are called cenotes. Yet the most salient feature of this area, and what really distinguishes it from other areas in the Maya world, is the Usumacinta River, which we see here. It is formed by the confluence of the Basion and the Chihoy rivers in Guatemala, as well as a, the, the flow of the Lacantun River in Mexico. So this region is not only unique due to its rugged landscape, its water bodies, but also because of its settlement history. Uh, we know very little still about the earliest people that settled in this region. Uh, and our goal with investigating Macabidero was to illuminate some of these earliest settlements uh, and what people were doing when they first got to this space. So it is within this rugged landscape that we find Macabidero, which as we'll learn throughout this presentation, is one of the earliest fortified settlements in the Maya lowlands. Some of the most notable features of Macabidero are its monumental walls and terraces that enclose the site on several sides. And we see images of those on the uh, in the bottom two pictures. These defensive features enclose large plazas with small platforms and pyramids, areas that would have served as public gathering spaces where people may have taken refuge in the past. And so my team's research at the site suggests that it was first built around 300 BCE functioning as a hilltop ceremonial space. So no defenses, just 
located on this very high, pla uh, high place on the landscape surrounded by caves and, and different water bodies. So it was a very uh, ceremonially and ritually charged environment. But at around 175 CE, the site underwent a flurry of construction where it was drastically transformed into a fortified refuge. By 350 CE, Macabedero was probably one of the largest sites in the region immediately prior to its abandonment just a few decades later. So uh, the team, my team's archeological research focused on studying this transition. What happened? Why were people fortifying this space at this particular moment in time prior to the, the you know, the, what we know as the classic period dynastic kings and queens. So what was going on before that? Those were some of the driving questions. And so to understand how and why people built this fortified refuge, my dissertation is looking at is as much about looking at how people, people build things together as it is about how conflict affects the scale and nature of what communities build. And so throughout, I'm thinking about communities as a, a social network that extends beyond our immediate king and where people are engaged in collective sacrifice, labor, responsibility, and celebration. Uh, and I'll get into a bit about how we've come to this, these definitions of community, particularly at this point in the past when we don't have written records and we don't have uh, more uh, verbal communication of what a community could have looked like. I also wanna recognize that uh, the work that we do in archeology, span we're never alone. It's, it's a team effort. And I want to really recognize that our team uh, particularly working in the Sierra de Lancandon, is composed of members of the community of La Tecnica and Santa Rita. So our friends and collaborators that make up our team lived in this portion of the jungle, the Sierra de Lancandon, during the Guatemalan Civil War. Many of my close collaborators and friends actually grew up as children uh, during until the late 90s when the peace accords were signed, and then they moved to the towns where they live today. And it's important because many of our research questions uh, insights, and even how we approach our investigations were developed together with uh, our member, co our collaborators, and their insights have been integral to our investigation, as we will see in the next couple of, of minutes. So how do we fit in GIS into this? How, how do we start answering some of these larger questions about what is this place, why it was built the way it was, and what's its history and relationship to the rest of the landscape? So traditionally, one of the first steps that we take in archaeology when investigating in our, an area of archaeological interest is to survey. We survey the site itself and its surrounding areas. So this involves extensive walking through the jungle, many times with a GPS, or we start marking uh, structures in other areas of interest. So as you can imagine, this is an incredibly slow process and it's hindered by the extensive canopy and difficult terrain that make planning and even locating some sites in this dense environment, particularly difficult and time consuming. So here we are, one of the first seasons that we were going to identify different portions of the archeological site, uh, just going through these uh, trails in the jungle trying to identify it. But once we have settled on a particular area to investigate, uh, the second step that we go to is mapping. So this is where GIS really comes in. So we start mapping regions and even entire sites using this machine that we see here, which is called a total station. Now you may have seen some of these machines around construction sites or when people are delimiting plots of land and really in, in very basic terms, what it's a fancy geometry calculator. What it does, it takes points on the landscape and documents their elevation, their easting or northing. Or in other words, it's documented its X, Y, Z coordinates, which we then are able to input into our geographic information system. So we can use some of the thousands of points generated from the total station, input them into our GIS environment. In this case, I've been using ArcMap, which is one of those standard programs for GIS, uh, where we can then extrapolate these points and the data uh, embedded within them to create digital elevation models. So that is on this map, the digital elevation model is what you see in shades of blue and, and brown and yellow. So this is one of the most standard ways that archeologists have been making maps of archeological sites and other areas of interest. But much like surveying, it's a slow painstaking process and it can be prone to error, particularly if multiple people are mapping different portions of the site. So, 
I'll give you a, a perfect example. So here is the map I made for a portion of Maccabi Leiro. This map was produced after several weeks and acquiring thousands of points uh, between two different field seasons when I was doing my dissertation. So although it is useful on its own, it fails to show a lot of the extent of the site because we did not have enough time to map every single feature. And the landscape itself really hindered the amount of or the different areas that we could document. Um, so for example, for this map, we can appreciate the fact that this section on the site is right on the edge of a precipice, is right on the edge of a cliff. Or that on the Eastern side of this area, we have over six monumental terraces that enclose this hill. Or even that beyond the walls here, there are large plazas that are enclosed by defensive systems. So in many ways, you would not only have to take my word that these features exist, but that they are ex exactly as I am interpreting them to be. So what is the solution to this? How can we create better position, more under a better understanding of this space? Um, so this word LIDAR has come in in recent years. Like I was mentioning, LIDAR is not particularly new. Pace and Sheets was using it in the late 80s to document uh, different features in Costa Rica. What has changed dramatically is the resolution that we can obtain from LIDAR uh, systems. And uh, just briefly, LIDAR is a system, a sensor, which is usually mounted on a drone or an airplane, usually one of these Cessna uh, two engine planes. And they emit different uh, pulses, light pulses that reach multiple levels on the ground. These pulses return to the sensor, recording the same thing we have with the total station elevation, uh, X coordinate, Y coordinate, but it has a fourth element that we'll get to at the end of this uh, presentation, which is called intensity. The intensity of the measurement, which is similar to what uh, remote sensing specialists have looked into for reflectance in satellite imagery. But what's really fascinating about this is that you can classify the points. You can tell, as you can see here, you can identify individual trees, canopy, you can see features on the ground. You can almost see this valley that we're traversing through now. But you can then select all of the points that are just on the ground. And what this does, it allows us to create very detailed, high resolution renditions of what is on the surface. And in the case for us, of what is what do actually uh, site archeological sites look like. So let's go back to my example of the site of Macabrero. So this is a map done over several weeks, painstakingly going through the jungle, documenting as many points of the whole landscape as possible. In less than a few days, draw, uh, uh, airplane mounted LIDAR sensors produced by NCOM uh, at the University of Texas has been able to produce a map that looks more like this. So here we can drastically see an improved resolution as to what's actually on the ground. And in fact, for us, it was impressive to note that there are whole sections of the site that we never even identified, even though we spent over three seasons of doing field work in this region. What's interesting, and this is not particularly new to just us doing research, every other archeologist have been implementing LIDAR systems or, or LIDAR data into their research have been identifying completely new areas in a, uh, completely new features and structures at archeological sites that they've worked on probably for the last decade. Um, so it's really illuminating the ways that we could look at the larger extent of a site. So I'll go back to that very same portion um, that we, I had mapped previously. And though importantly though, um, one of the things to recognize is that just because we can identify features digitally, there still needs to be, ver they still need to be verified on the ground. And even interpretations of their function need to be couched in previous research as well as ethnographic history in order to know what these structures are, how they likely were used, and what's their history, what, are, what is their role within the larger system. And so from these LIDAR derived elevation models, we can start creating interactive 3D renditions that better demonstrate the site. So here we're looking at from the south looking north, and you can see these large plazas that are located on these valleyed areas. And we as well, we can see some of the pir uh, pyramidal uh, structures that ident that you know, define this space as well as some of the monumental walls that enclose it. And here's another view, like I was mentioning before, from some of those original maps, you couldn't really get the fact that we're standing on the edge of a hill of an escarpment. 
uh, that leads directly down to the Isumo Sinta River. And so with these new technologies, we're able to really start uh, not only presenting, but answering and asking new questions. And so another way that we're using some of these digital technologies within a GIS environment uh, is to document excavations themselves. Um, so traditionally, uh, excavations are recorded using some of these drawings, you know, very detailed drawings and photographs. Uh, it gives us a pretty good idea of the architecture, what we're excavating, and the different features that we're identifying. But one of the ways that since we were a very small team, we wanted to create a lot more precision into how we were looking and documenting our excavations. So we turned to photogrammetry. So photogrammetry is this technology where we're able to merge multiple images to create 3D renditions of surfaces. Uh, and in the case of Macabilero, one of some of the methodologies that we developed were using these target points. Uh, these target points, we're able to add coordinates to them down to the centimeter. And then we place these targets around their excavation. So this is how they look like digitally. So then using a program called uh, Metashape, we're able to add different points on these targets, input the coordinate data for each of them, and it will give us highly accurate, almost millimeter accurate renditions of our excavations and any other feature that we decide to document. So one of the ways that we were doing this was using a handheld camera, uh, a DSLR, a Canon DSLR that we walked around the edges of the excavation and documented every single corner of it from multiple angles. And here we have our colleague Rigalo Rodas uh, doing that. So for that very excavation I showed you previously. Another way that we're documenting uh, via photogrammetry is using drones. So we're able to fly the drones, you know, very carefully through navigating through the trees and taking very detailed pictures from above. And then one of the methodologies that we developed in the field that worked for us was that instead of waiting to process all this data, either at the end of the day or back when we returned to our labs in Guatemala City, we were actually processing them on the spot. So we would carry our laptops and external batteries and we would process all the points in the field. So we would start getting uh, 3D renditions that look like this. Now, what's great about this, uh, uh, is not is uh, this these technologies are not meant to remove drawing or traditional recording methods, but they're meant to supplement them. They're meant to provide an additional layer that other people can then look at and come to their own conclusions about the work that we did and what it means to the larger uh, archaeological history of this area. Um, the other great thing about this is that they're all publicly available. So if you search for Magavidero on our Sketchfab page, our project Sketchfab page. You're gonna see that all of the excavations that we did are publicly available and are part of our larger informants, not only to the Guatemalan, Guatemalan government too, but to the public at large. So it allows us to create very highly detailed, high resolution data sets that are then available to anybody who's interested in assessing the kind of work that we were doing at the site. One of the great things is that we're able to, from these 3D models, we're able to export into GIS high resolution ortho photos. So these are photos that are geographically um, aligned basically, and they have an incredible resolution. And we can include this within the rest of the geospatial data that we start acquiring for a site. And here's a view, this is the same image, not, it's not zoomed in or anything, it's just stretched out. So you can really tell the resolution of this. Uh, you can tell, for example, you can see the collapsed structure here, as well as even small things like roots and rocks that may be overkill for some of the archeological interpretations that we want to, to achieve, but nonetheless, it provides an additional layer of data. And it's very easy, very simple to do. Uh, and, it, and it really helps us in documenting these sites further, you know, as archeology span is a destructive science. So we really only get one chance at documenting these features properly. The other way that we're using photogrammetry is to document the actual artifacts recovered from these excavations. So this is uh, one of the bolts that we found from one of the nearby caves. And we can easily uh, replicate the same systems we use to document excavations to document different artifacts and features. And so through all of this extensive documentation of the site and our excavation, uh, we learned, you know, as I was saying before, between 300 BCE and 200 CE, that there are important structural changes to the site, focused on improving its defensive capacities, as well as expanding the public space in the form of larger plazas. 
So in the South Plaza, we know that the original buildings were destroyed and buried and the orientations completely changed. And after this, the users of Macabilero built seven levels of megalithic terraces that enclosed the main group of the site on the east. And as you saw before, with a natural limestone wall enclosing the group from the west. And here's our, our good friend Chano pointing at some of the foundations for these terraces. And I wanted to mention just to provide a little bit more context. So along with the walls and terraces, we also documented extensive caches of rounded stones that were buried within the structures, plazas, and even the caves at the site. These stones are, you know, we interpret them as possible weapons used by the inhabitants of the site. And at Macabilero, these possible weapons have been found in almost every single context within the walled portions of the site and virtually none outside of these spaces. And so, it was, was, was with discussions with our collaborators that we were actually able to identify these as sling stones. And here's a, a cleaned up image of one of the caches that we excavated from the site. So to better understand how we use these sling stones uh, or how, how they might've been used in the past, we talked with current users of this weapon. So here we have our, our friend Don Feliciano, the grandfather of one of my colleagues, showing me how he uses his slings. And so it was from these conversations that I found that in the Department of the Paten, in the Guatemala, these spheres are actually commonly used to scare off birds from fields and to hunt small animals. And so many people in the Paten still make use of these slings and make them out of pita, or this like nylon string that you see him holding, and either carve the stones or make them out of clay spheres, and they still use them to hunt. So here we see Don Feliciano in action showing us how to use the sling, um, which helped us really understand that this is a very likely a defensive space. And as such, that opened the way to new questions, particularly regionally. So one of the first things that we wanted to know after excavating at the site is, so how did Macabellero relate to the nearby landscape, particularly the ecology of the region? Uh, and to this end, we use several different data sets, including satellite imagery, as well as elevation models that are derived from the LIDAR data. So one of the first things that we used was Worldview 2 data, which is a satellite sensor that has a very high spatial resolution. That means it has uh, two meter pixels and around eight distinct wavelengths. So it's able to record uh, light intensity in different wavelengths. And so and to better understand the ecology regionally, what we did is that I linearly unmixed the satellite image using MATLAB, using a code that we created using MATLAB. The spectral linear unmixing was used to identify and delineate the varying spectral properties present in the data, or in this case, in this forested area. And so two of the leading researchers of this methodology, cassava, uh, cassava and mustard, so they actually described this as a procedure where a mixed pixel is decomposed uh, into its constituent spectra, or in this case, also known as end members. Specifically, the analysis is aimed to identify uh, different ecological zones for the region near Macabilero. And the hypothesis that we were testing is, is that different ecological zones in the Sumacinta River Valley will present nuanced differences in their spectral properties that will in turn be identified by the image. So that is areas with marshes will have spectrally distinct signatures from water bodies, uh, sand, exposed rocks, or even the dense canopy. And overall, it was very successful in identifying variability in this seemingly homogeneous space. So each end member that you see here corresponds to a spectrally distinct feature on the surface. Now, it gets more interesting when you start combining these into new images. Right? So by combining these end members into an RGB image, uh, we were able to identify areas that have the highest density of, or highest diversity of signatures. So for example, in this image, I'm combining end members one, two, and five will relate to different types of vegetation to highlight the most ecologically diverse regions in the Sierra de Lancandón, which are located just north and northeast of this laguneta, of this lake that you see here in black. So as spectrally distinct zones, as particularly health areas of very healthy vegetation due to a high spectrum uh, or reflectance values and their proximity to water bodies, 
these regions might have served uh, several purposes for Maya peoples living here in the past. One possible explanation for these spectrally diverse areas is that they're remnants of managed forests or even sites where wetland agriculture was happening. So from that, we were able to create vectors of these different areas and then point out what sites are contemporary alongside them. And so what we start seeing is that some of the clustering of the highest reflectance values or highest health for some of these vegetation are also coincide with areas that have more ecological variability. And they're all located just northeast of Macabilero. So it is not a coincidence then that these nearby sites or the sites that you see here in black are located just out of the way in higher elevation area that avoided seasonal flooding. Um, but it is likely that the sites with pre-classic settlements, such as the one, so, so sites that are contemporary to Macabilero, such as the ones we see here as Fajardo, Ana, Fideo, and Esmeralda, were settled here to take advantage of the natural resources these areas may have provided. And although it's still in its preliminary stages, uh, we're looking at some of the, how the LIDAR data can help us complement with actual surface signatures. Um, so from the LIDAR that we know that some portions of these air high spectral signatures correspond directly with wetland fields. And we see these highlighted uh, in these lines in the dark green. Other regions though are immediately adjoining wetland fields. Yet the fields are not immediately visible in the surface LIDAR data. And so from the available data that we have so far, what we suggest is that signatures currently related to healthy forests are possibly the remnants of managed forests uh, and not just something that uh, emerged out of luck. So it's, it's, the, it's the legacy effects of people modifying this space. And so from our excavations and our remote analysis, we know that Macabrero was quickly transformed into a fortress that it served as a de uh, defensive um, temporary refuge with a plaza allowing uh, several individuals. But we still had one large question and I see I'm, I'm running out of time so I'll move through some of these next sections a little bit quicker. Um, but we still had a question about where were people living? We still don't have, even with all these new data set that we were able to acquire, we don't really have an understanding of where people were living within the site. There's no houses. Uh, we were able to uh, excavate one house outside of the walled areas of Macabinero, and its its occupation likely came after Macabinero was abandoned. So we still don't really have a good idea of where people were living, what was the extent of the community that used this space, uh, and how we could address that. So, so although these are questions that GIS can assist us with, it does not really provide a starting point. Uh, how do we start addressing what a community is in the past in areas that we don't have good uh, documentation or even records of from the same people? So this is where we draw on. So this is where we draw on ethnographic and ethnohistorical research. So to best interpret results from geospatial analyses, we have been integrating the knowledge of space and boundaries of endohistoric and ethnographic sources. So among the documents that we've been looking into is Alianza de Guadalajara which was made in the 1530s. So the document recounts the conquest of the Guatemalan highlands and presents the movement on some of the forces going down into Guatemala. So historic maps such as the Alianza de Coquitlán integrate the narrative of movement in physical space that are in their ideal documents to try and understand how alliances and communities were defined in Mesoamerica. And although I'm not going to get into this so much now, I would like to point out that the lienzos, such as the Guagachalan, provide great insights into the landscape adaptations made to create a defensive spaces by Cachigal Maya communities in the highlands during the height of colonialism, specifically walls and barricades like the ones depicted here. Another important comparative resource ethnographic uh, ethnographies done with indigenous communities in Chiapas and Oaxaca, particularly the works I've unfolded. Uh, with the caveat, you know, that contemporary communities are not static reflections of the past and ethnograph, but nonetheless, ethnographic studies provide important information about how indigenous people think about and have engaged historically in community building. So these, these sources, particularly the works of Mbo and other anthropologists into the Tzotil Maya towns of Tinagantan and Chamula and Chiapas, provide important analogies to understand community borders and cooperative action. 
Importantly, like I was mentioning, they're not meant to be one-to-one -one correlates between indigenous communities that are separated by time and space, but instead useful analogies from which to build our interpretations and as a starting point for some of the uh, geospatial analysis that we could do. And so specifically, some of the data from both suggest that we need to reevaluate how communities or boundaries are defined for Tzotzil Maya peoples and that are not wholly determined by continuous settlement. Uh, that is, movement through a landscape with an idealized center forms part of the boundaries of a community. So and data from this study suggests that socially integrated communities may have extended kilometers, even if there's no continuous settlement. Now, we can get into this a little bit later in the Q&A, but I'd like to point out that some of the new LIDAR data that's coming around regionally is supporting some of these assertions that will also have been the case in the past. So we have long scale or, or, or almost continuous settlement in some areas and not in others, others that we know were politically and socially aligned with one another. So we're starting to see this uh, also being reflected in the past. So with this in mind, I wanted to ask how are contemporary sites from a Cabrillero or how far contemporary sites are from a Cabrillero and how long it would take to walk to them. So the idea being, you know, if, you, if uh, somebody needed to take refuge at the site during raids, they can't live very far. So for a modified Tobler's hike function, which is an algorithm that you can do in, G in GIS, I was able to approximate the time it would take to cover a particular distance on the landscape. So here, areas in dark blue take the least amount of time to walk to, and regions in red take the most amount of time. So what we're finding is that these con same contemporary centers that are nearby possible managed forests, wetland fields, uh, and are contemporary to Macabulero are at most a five-hour walk from the site. So actually quite close. It's less than a half a day's walk to these places. Um, so we're starting to get a picture of what the boundaries of this community are, even though we don't have direct extensive settlements in between them. So a second analysis that I wanted to conduct regarding what were the visible areas? So, you know, visibility allowed for some sense of communication across far distances. And the human eye is able to, actually the human eye in here are able to differentiate individual sounds and, and, and people up to five kilometers away. So it's actually quite extensive that we could see. So in this analysis, what I did instead is place a three kilometer buffer to just to make sure everything that is visible is really, really within the human or the human capacity to see. And so one of the things that we found out is through this analysis is that a lot of these contemporary centers start forming visibility clusters. They start forming areas where they're intervisible and then their edges are frayed. There's not much intervisibility beyond them. So of particular interest to us is the site of Macabidero and its cluster here that we see in green. So you see, again, the same sites that are less than five hours walk away near all these water bodies and perennial systems are also within eyesight of each other. And more interestingly, other areas that are contemporary or other sites that are contemporary to Macabrero form their own clusters separate from us. Uh, a particular interest is the one in teal at the bottom, which is centered on the site of San Culero, which is the only other known defensive site in this region that is contemporary to Macabrero. And that is telling because it means we start looking at potential smaller community clusters that were forming around a, a set of communal goals, in this case, particularly defense. Another line of evidence I went on to draw to better understand what was going on regionally using GIS was movement. So just very briefly, we've used maps uh, created by Chobert Baller in the early 19 or in 1901-ish, and then more recent maps by Cantor and Pentecost that describe possible routes of movement in this region. So I was able to digitize these. And what they start to tell you uh, very interestingly is that there are different travel corridors in this region. Uh, so in red, we see the modern trails uh, that Cancer and Pentecost documented. Uh, and then in purple, we can start seeing some of the trails that Ma Etobert Mahler followed in 1901. Interestingly though, some of them coincide, which likely suggests that these were not only a recent trail, but one that has a long history. Another step that we took then was to do least cost paths uh, between over, uh, I think it was uh, 20,000 points or 209 points, creating over 30,000 potential travel routes or travel corridors. 
Now, this is too much to assess in and of itself. So we combine them along with one of the most frequent maps uh, trails here in blue, along with the modern trails and the areas that were visible in the past. So what we start to see is that these sites were not randomly located. Uh, they're not just like afterthoughts of how to, how to occupy and modify the space, but they were consciously built and they serve multiple purposes. So for the case of Macavilero, the areas actually at an intersection, what could have been an important travel corridor going west to east and east to west across the Usumacinta River, where Macavilero not only was in a defensible position, but had ample visibility of the region and could have potentially controlled the movement. So it's that we start getting uh, not necessarily as concrete answers, but possible questions to continue further uh, investigating and answering in the future. Now, I know we don't have too much time, but I wanted to briefly mention some of the work that we're doing at the site of El Zot. So just as a reference, El Zot is in central Guatemala. We see it here in red. And it's the research at El Zot has been part of this very, very large LIDAR initiative by, by uh, um, an NGO called Patunam, which has really sponsored all this continued research. And what they're doing is that it, having extensive LIDAR catchment areas uh, of the northern of northern Guatemala, of the Department of the Paten. And so what you see here in different shades of color are actually all of the new features that have been identified because of this initiative. So what we're getting at is a lot more nuanced understanding of how dense or not the occupation of certain areas is. But what's interesting about the Bakunam initiative is that it's using a new form of LIDAR sensor. It's called a multispectral Titan sensor. And what it does is not only record the XYZ data that I was telling you about, but it's actually recording multiple lines of intensity of that is the spectral value of the surfaces that includes the canopy and the floor. So one of the things that I've been working with with Thomas Garrison uh, and Stephen Houston is thinking about what we can do with the spectra of surfaces. So before, as I was saying, before, uh, as I was showing you before with the satellite imagery, we're highly relying on the spectra of the canopy to understand what's going on on the ground. So it's really just a proxy. But with this new LIDAR sensor, we're actually able to tell directly what the spectra on the ground can tell us. And so for example, here's an image of the site of Tikong. And you can see that it has the areas that have less canopy have higher intensity values. Uh, and you can start noticing different things, but you gotta wanna draw your attention to this area on the top right, where it used to be an old airfield. Part of it is a paved parking lot. Others is, is just dirt paths. And you can see that each of these areas has different colors, which denote a different spectral signature. This is the same, this is the town of Washaktun, and you can start seeing those same differences on the ground. Uh, and near the site of El Sots, we've been able to use this to like, spectrally identify wetland agricultural areas, including canals, channels, as well as old uh, uh, lake beds or, or old cenote beds, uh, not cenote beds, uh, aguada beds here. Uh, they may have been used uh, for agriculture. So there's a lot of, it, it's what's great about these new technologies and sensors is that they don't really answer all of our questions, but they allow us to pose new ones that then we're using more traditional methods in archeology span and supplementing that with ethnohistorical and ethnographic research, we're able to continuously grow the research and making a more accessible enterprise for everybody. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate all your attention on this and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. So the question is, uh, do you ever determine against whom they were defending? So that's actually, that's actually an incredibly complicated question. Um, just because since we don't have, um, we don't really have records of this and we're not, we're not completely knowledgeable of what the political alliances might have been at the time. One of our hypotheses that remains to be tested is that they were defending themselves potentially from people coming in uh, through these trade routes. So they really, they were trying to defend their control over these trade routes. Another possibility is that they were defending themselves. Uh, so just in the, around the same time that Macabalero was being fortified, the site of Piedras Negras, which is one of the largest dynastic centers in the Maya lowlands, uh, started growing not only in its construction of the site itself, but in its power regionally. So one of the hypotheses is that 
the people here were threatened by this growing in power from the Dainas of Piedras Negras and set up a system to counteract that, to maintain some sense of autonomy. But we can't really answer these questions for sure just yet. Uh, it's an area that will have to be continued studied by other, other folks. The other possibility is that they were actually defending themselves from the other contemporary pre-classic clusters that we saw. So those other contemporary communities. So the site of San Cudero just, uh, I think is about 30 kilometers below from uh, Macavilero is the only other defensive site uh, in the in contemporary in the region that we know of that we've been able to identify. There, there are things in the, in the newly acquired LIDAR data for the region that might suggest that this might be part of a larger pattern, but we're not ready to, to, to answer definitely those things yet. But there's something that we are looking into. So I see, uh, Kalai, you, you're asking about uh, uh, if you can talk about more about the abandonment of Macabidero. Uh It seems to have gone significant shifts, a particularly more interesting moment in Mayan history. Yeah, exactly. So it's, you know, by the beginning of 100, 150 CE, we see that it's, it's a massive shift. Uh, the old structures are destroyed, buried, and all of the material that was used to use to construct them was used to fill terraces, these defensive terraces, as well as plazas. So we're seeing that the investment is on public spaces, particularly these incredibly large plazas. And I don't have the figure with me uh, out of the top of my head, but we're talking it could fit thousands of people at a given moment uh, uh, using metrics developed by Takeshi Nomata on the performance is use of these public spaces. So it is, it is an incredible shift. And what we're seeing is that it doesn't last very long. So by 300 CE, most of the construction in Macavidero stops. And we don't really see a lot more coming in in later periods, even though contemporary sites are flourishing. Piedra Negras becomes uh, just 15 kilometers north. And I'll, let me go back to, to one of the maps real quick. Piedra Negras becomes the, one of the largest and most politically important centers in the region. Uh, so Piedras Negras, I don't know if you can see, it's, it's just one of these black dots immediately above Macavilero. Um, so it is, it is fascinating to think that at the time these dynastic kings were really, really gaining power, Macavilero just ceases to, to be used and, and is abandoned. Another, po um, another possibility is that, you know, the, another important site is called El Cayo, and it's right across the river. You can see it from Macavilero. And one of the arguments that my team has made is that they're actually part of the same site. It's actually just different portions of the same settlement. El Cayo having more of the early classic, you know, 200 CE onwards uh, occupation while Macabilero had the very earlier stuff. And in fact, some of the Sahales or Lords of El Cayo actually identifies, this is something Stephen Houston has pointed out. They have actually identified themselves as Lord of the Hills which is likely a callback to Macabilero as being this place on a you know, fortified hilltop. But it's, it's something that re will, remain, will remain to be investigated later on. But what's fascinating is that with increased ladder data and increased attention to this, we're starting to find this is not as rare as we thought it was, that this shift is part of a larger uh, social and political shift taking place in the Maya lowlands. And my hunch is that it has to do with resistance to uh, dynastic kings, which actually did not emerge in this region, but was but came to it in later periods. So that might be one of the reasons why there was that shift uh, in defensiveness at the site. Uh, Andre is asking how the imaging information added to the understanding of water management and infrastructure in the studied areas. So it's still in preliminary stages. We acquired the data earlier uh, last year from NCOM, and we're incredibly grateful for the support on this. But one of the issues with LIDAR data, uh, especially at this scale, is that it takes so long to review manually and to do it correctly. So we're just starting to identify some of these larger features. But one of the things that I can talk about is that, for example, remember those lake areas that I was mentioning just, uh, just northeast of Macavilero? So those were all modified in the past. One of these lakes has a humongous berm that's blocking the movement of the one of the arroyos, one of the rivers just north of it. Um, that's not natural, that was created. Uh, so we're starting to see some of the larger developments uh, that were occurring in this area. So 
So you're not able to see it as clearly, but on, on the higher portion here, that's a modified berm. That's a human created berm and it diverted the arroyo. So what we're seeing is that there's larger water management modification. And one of my favorite things that our collaborators, uh, as I was mentioning, you know, there were refugees here during the civil war. So they know this landscape incredibly well. And one of the things that they've been able to help us identify is that along different portions of this arroyo, of this river, there are dams uh, that they didn't create, but they are still in use. They still are used to not only hold back water and create small pools, but uh, as uh, fisheries almost, you can have fish that get stuck there and it's very easy. Uh, and these coincidentally, are very close to some of these pre-classic settlements that we have here. So there's a whole range of uh, hydrological modifications that they were doing that were just at the beginning of trying to understand. And that is that's a whole other research uh, agenda. So Kelsey's asking about, uh, if I could speak a little bit more about the strengths of drawing versus photogrammetic models and how have you run into problems ground truthing the LIDAR data? Uh, multiple, I'll start with the ground truthing, multiple problems. The LiDAR data, uh, one of the main issues that we have so far is that to get better resolution, we need a higher density of points, particularly points that are able to reach the ground. Now, in high canopy areas, uh, that gets limited. A lot of the ma majority of the points bounce back from the canopy and we don't really get the ground points. Uh, it, but it's even worse in area that have been cut for, for agricultural purposes and then left fallow. And then this, this type of grass called sacate grows. And it's like this very dense bush. I don't know if you remember in Jurassic Park where the velociraptors love to hide that kind of grass. So that kind of stuff is destroys anything you can see on the surface. So I guess you know that it has a fantastic article addressing how the vegetation on the surface affects uh, the resolution of the ground points and what we can actually determine from the LIDAR. And it's actually kind of disappointing to see that, you know, depending on the vegetation on the ground, particularly that sacate, that high grass area, we can't really say much. There's not much we can tell other than general shapes. We don't get that resolution because it just, the points don't know how to even classify that as well. And Macabidero, for example, one of the things that we saw is that it actually removed some of the known terraces and actually smoothed them out because they're on a hill. So the algorithm itself wasn't able to, one, it wasn't able to acquire at the necessary points to reach these. So for example, these terrace, this bottom terrace, you can see it's, you know, you can see our, our friend Luis here standing right next to it. It's larger than him. He's about 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, um, these walls don't even show up on the LIDAR. Uh, I remember when the Pacuna initiative did the lighter at the site of Tikal, one of the one of the larger temples, I think I don't know if it was Temple One or Two, just wasn't even in the data. <laughs> the algorithm had removed it, uh, thinking it was canopy. So you can see there's a lot of errors that still need to be addressed uh, because it's not it's not an objective uh, sensor. You know, we input it's 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 there's a the human interface will always be present uh, even if we don't think of it that way. So it, there's limitations as to what we can do. But what's great is that it gives us a starting point. It's, it's, we know, oh, there's a cluster of, site, of features here that we want to investigate. We don't longer have to go walking through the jungle or rely just on uh, our collaborators' expertise of the region. We can combine all of that and say, okay, let's go investigate this area and actually determine what's going on. I remember talking to Tom Garrison for Zotz. There's an, uh, I think it was it was around and 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 please forget don't take my word for this because I'm blanking on the actual percentage, but there's about like thirty or forty percent of false positives uh, in the lidar data. Uh, um, investigation. I know I have a lot of colleagues who think uh, lidar is just the end of survey. It's like no no no, it's just another tool. It's the beginning of more research in these areas. Um, and then the advantages, so the advantages of drawing versus photogrammetry. So I do both still. I, I draw, but then I, I sometimes what I do is I get the main features from the drawing, everything to scale. I get the photographic model and then the ortho photo from that from a particular, let's say a profile or a plan view of our excavations. And then I overlay that to my original drawing and then add details. I'm able to add a lot more details into that. Now, 
my opinion is to moving forward. I know there's some resistance from folks who really do see drawing as an interpretive and as a learning element of archaeological documentation. And I don't disagree with that. I just think that with photogrammetic models, we're able to realize, uh, or we're able to acquire a lot more resolution. And a drawing will always be an interpretation of what we're seeing on the ground, right? It's not a, a highly realistic one as an interpretation, which is incredibly useful. But photogrammetic modeling and three in ortho photos provide an additional data that it goes alongside with that. So it doesn't necessarily supplant or replace, but it, it just goes alongside that and helps us have a better understanding. So there's things like color, texture that are better appreciated from these models than uh, they were, particularly to people who are not versed in archeological drawing, who don't know specifically. But I'm thinking uh, um, Alex Sokovini uses a lot of these to teach his students how uh, features look like on the ground, what actual uh, profile excavation actually looks like on the ground. Uh, while teaching them to draw. So there's ways that they can, uh, students are able to better understand what it is that we do in our practice and uh, how to improve it. Yeah, so Laura's asking, how can you, can you say more about the Aguada beds? How are they different and similar from other agricultural areas? So that's still an area that we're looking into. Um, so at El Zox, uh, we've been working closely with Kim and Cheryl Beach, who are paleoethnobotanists and have actually, they have a lot of experience working in lake beds specifically. Like that's that's one of their areas of expertise. So what we're able to do with the, the multispectral LIDAR currently is one, identify them as spectrally distinct areas and two, assess, uh, basically use that information to identify other similar features in that region. Um, I don't, I think at this point, we can't use the signatures from one region to understand the signatures uh, from another region, there's too many variables in between, uh, and none of these are lab tested uh, signatures. So like we don't have the spectra in a lab with a spectrometer to say, okay, this is the spectra at these micrometers. It's like, we don't have that yet. We're not at that level. But what's interesting though, is that because they are spectrally distinct, they would suggest that they had a different use or they had a different history of, of use later on uh, after they were first built. And one of the things, uh, Tim Murtha uh, and Cheryl, uh, no, not Tim Murtha, sorry. Uh, uh, Tim and Cheryl Beach have been finding is that uh, these were highly modeled. Some of them had uh, a line, like a plaster bed. So there were water catchment areas as well. So it could be a difference that some of these are water catchment areas for you know drinking water and other purposes. Some of them are connected to canals. So that means they might've been a large catchment area that were then fed to different agricultural spaces throughout the, this valley area. But again, like I was saying, right now it's, right now we're able to ask questions we didn't even know we had uh, before this data. So we don't have all of the answers as to how are they actually concretely different. Uh, we just have signatures pointing us towards like, there seems to be a difference is it actually correlated to structural components of these aguada beds or are they related to just different spectra? So it could be maybe a specific kind of algae grows there that alters the spectral composition that, that we're getting from the sensor. So it's really, it's really exciting. So if, you know, if uh, there's a lot of opportunities for additional research, particularly uh, new students coming in, new researchers coming into this field, uh, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of opportunities stemming from this. Uh, and even just a single one of these questions could be a whole dissertation topic uh, if developed correctly, you know. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. The next one I see here is um, Raymond Alexander Hunter's question about um, processing photogrammetry in the field. Would you like me to re read it? Oh yeah, I can't find it here. Okay. Oh. Um, yeah, he says, uh, thank you. I'm intrigued that you're processing photogrammetry in the field. Has this altered your archaeological practice or workflow in the field? And are there advantages over processing in the lab later on? Yeah, no, that's, that's actually a great question. So one of the reasons that we decided to basically process in the field uh, using our laptop is because there's a, there's a, so when you're doing archeological research, you wanna document everything as specific and as detailed as possible. So there's 
countless of photographs, countless of drawings, countless of, of just notes that we take on multiple areas. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to verify is that we had the most accurate representation of an, of, of an excavation at a particular stage before moving on to the next stage. So that was really, it was more a preemptive measure to know, to make sure everything works. We're not missing pictures. We're not, the profile is, is in high resolution. We're not missing a corner of it that might be of interest later on after we continue excavating and we can go back. So it was really more a process of, of making sure everything was done correctly the first time, and then we can continue on with our excavation. But what it did though, is that while that was processing, while you know, we downloaded the images from the DSLR, the drone, I would process this using this uh, software called Agisoft Metashape. It used to be called Photoscan. Uh, we would process it uh, at a low resolution, which means that if pictures are missing, we will be able to tell but it's not gonna take as long as processing in at a higher resolution, which will give us a lot more detail and granularity to the model. Um, so in the meantime, what it did, actually what it did for us was, while well, that was processing, we were alone there. No, it's not like anyone's gonna happen. We would cover it with a little tarp and then go do more survey while well, that was processing. So we knew it'll be like, it was like an hour and a half or something to make sure that we have enough data to continue. So we would stop that particular excavation and then we would start and do surveys. So we would try and document uh, materials in the caves. We would then go and visit other areas of the terraces. And in fact, it was during this that we were able to identify that all of Macabibero, the whole thing is built on top a series of caves and crevasses. So, and what the Maya did in the past was they're the same kind of block stones that we see on this walls. They see they cut the same kind and just fill these crevasses, filled, 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 filled. Um, so everything in this area was highly, highly modified. So that's one of the ways it altered our view. So we were constantly excavating. We had the time to look, document, reflect, do some survey, like free our mind a little bit, and then come back to it fresh and take the next steps that we wanted to do. So that's how it that's how it influenced. Uh, our, our work there. One thing, one caveat though, my computer was destroyed after that. The humidity, the bugs, uh, the high intensity of processing. It was not a, a workstation per se, which is my personal laptop. It did not enjoy doing the work in the humidity, but it got the job done. And now with additional computing, I mean, Lenovo's and stuff like that are much better suited for that kind of work. Um, but yeah, no, it did, it did alter, it altered quite a bit. We were going through that. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, Omar. Um, and this one is a very general one that's asking for advice or training that you have for graduate students and faculty who are interested in learning GIS mapping, or I'm just going to add kind of any of the technological me methodologies that you've introduced to us today. Oh, yeah. So, so two things. One, for photogrammetry, which can be used with or without GIS. With GIS is actually a lot more powerful too, of course, but you can use it just by itself and it, cre and it creates beautiful materials and work that are very, it will be very useful for your uh, research. So with photogrammetry, what's great is that Metashape provides a 30-day a trial of their software and they do have student discounts and educational discounts and stuff like that for their more expensive for their pro software. But what's great about it, it's YouTube. Go on YouTube, look up a uh, pro procedure for Agisoft Metashape, and it has so much clear instructions of how to proceed. And then once you're able, once you're able to get a trial, go out with a camera. It could it, at this point, it could be your phone's camera. Uh, if you, you know, if you have a smartphone, those cameras are very well suited for this kind of work, just because they also document. Uh, the X, Y, Z coordinates directly. So camera has that, all that EXIF or, or how do you pronounce that again? Is that EXIF? Archive data on it, which helps in the processing. So what I would suggest is like, watch a couple of YouTube videos on that and then go in the field and practice. Uh, if there's a monument on campus, try and photograph it at many sites, many angles, process it, what's missing? What other areas that you need to take additional pictures? What angles are you looking at that might be better? My other suggestion, and I think this is gonna be key to anybody doing archeological geospatial sciences or even geospatial data science moving forward. Learn how to code. 
this is, I cannot explain how much it's going to help you not only understand the processes that are happening uh, behind the scenes, but it will give you a better understanding on how to automate large data sets, how to do processes and automate and automate large analyses. So my, my suggestion is learn Python. Uh, there's a few resources, uh, open access resources made by a lot of archaeologists on how to use Python, Jupyter Notebooks, and other uh, elements that help you understand GIS much better. And then uh, if you're able to take a actual GIS course, uh, at the, you know, during college, during your graduate studies, I highly recommend it. And then work directly with uh, remote sensing specialists. That's where I learned the most a lot about a lot of these analyses and how to include them into archaeological research is because I was working directly with people who do planetary sciences. Uh, they are the ones that are not only at the cutting edge, edge of this research, but they're the ones creating or, or informing how these sensors are being produced and working. So I think the goal for us as people who are adopting this technology is not necessarily to be at the forefront and create new ones, although that is definitely a possibility, but it's to really understand what it is it's doing, to really understand the algorithms behind the scenes, to understand uh, as really just like code base in the background and understand that uh, this needs to be catered with uh, or this needs to be focused or interpreted within uh, the people and, and communities that we're researching, right? In and of itself, the GIS is just a, a tool. Uh, it's not really gonna give you any concrete evidence. It's the interpretation through what people have told us and what we're able to acquire from ethnographic and historic research that actually informs and makes it interesting. Or it actually gives us some answers based on this data. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to send you some resources that I know of that are open access. Uh, and we could disseminate those to the to students uh, and researchers as as they see fit. That's terrific. Thank you so much, Omar. And thank you again for um, an incredibly stimulating and fascinating presentation. Thanks to all in attendance and once again to our co-sponsor, the Department of Anthropology and the Lichter and Stupp Fund. Um, we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Take care.